and earth for our sin. Let's make a big deal out of Him tonight. Please go ahead and be seated if you can. You don't have to. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 9. I don't even know how much I'm going to get into this thing once I begin to speak. But what an honor it is to be in this house tonight. I consider Isaiah a brother. I consider Nino a father. Um, when we are taking him to the airport, I just begin to look at him. And, I, I man, I was just taken back by how much wisdom. Every time I get around this man, he just begins to pour into my life and my wife's life. And we just appreciate everything that he is for the kingdom, what he's done for his family, his wife, his children, what he's done for this community, what he is doing. I'm telling you, do not despise the day of small beginnings of what's getting ready to happen in this house in this and I feel the Holy Ghost I'm telling you don't despise the day of what you see right now in the natural get ready for what God is getting ready to do in an entire city I just want to tell everybody in the room listen I've spent adult time out if you know what that is man I've done my time okay I was in the Marine Corps when I was 18 years old I literally was preaching probably I want to say six months ago, and literally this woman comes up to me when I get done in Toledo, Ohio, and she said, God is building a bridge from you from Ohio back to California, and you're going to see one of the greatest revivals come out of Ohio and California that's going to flip the nation upside down, and I know that it's overtaken and awakened 209, joined together in a marriage of a voice that's going to shift an entire nation. Don't despise the shepherd boy in the field that that nobody knows about. Literally, as I begin to pray for this house, all I begin to hear is victory. I'm telling you right now, there's victory in this house tonight. And this is not your finish line. I don't care where you're at in the race, but I'm telling you right now, I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you're going through. I'm telling you right now, this is not the finish line of your life. God's got a story that he wants to release out of your life. So enjoy the hell that you're going through because the hell is going to be the fuel that lights your fire for a testimony of Jesus Christ. Oh, there's so much confirmation and such a stirring in my heart as I sit in this place that literally uh, two days before I got on the plane, I was sleeping and I had a dream. And in the dream, it went like this. And listen, I've not talked to Nino, I've not talked to Isaiah. But in the dream, I was in this very place preaching this service, and it was straight throw down Holy Ghost. People were getting set free. They were getting delivered. They were getting healed. There was such a move of God that was taking place. And when we got done, we get in the car. And I look at Isaiah, and I'm like, man, wasn't that awesome? And he looked at me, and he said this. It was okay. And I'm like, oh, I didn't really know how to receive that, you know, because... When you think God's moving one way, he's really just setting you up for something greater. Because too many of us stake claim on what God did yesterday and what God did in a moment. And it's only set up for what God's getting ready to do bigger in the future. And so as we begin to drive, I'm like, well, what, what do you think we should do? And this is what he said. Let's go win one soul for Jesus. He said, I don't care what happened in the church service. Let's go win one soul for Jesus right now. Right now, let's go win one soul for Jesus. So we start driving, and we go down to the grocery store. And we start walking to and fro in the grocery store in the dream. And we try to talk to people, and people are rejecting us, and they're not talking to us. And all of a sudden, I find a man that was a Baptist believer, and he was sick. And we begin to pray for him. He got healed. And I'm there. We found one person. He said, no, I'm telling you, the mandate is that we go find one person and begin to win them for Jesus. And there was such a, 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 his heart was so set on finding one person. So we walk outside the grocery store and we see, listen to me, we see on the outside of the grocery store a food bank line. So I start looking at your video and now the dream's starting to make sense. See, we go into the place where people think that they have it all together and they're not willing to sacrifice. And they think that they have what they need and they can buy. But what God is looking for is a bunch of wild, radical misfits that know that they have a need for something that is bigger in their life. So in the dream we see this food bank line and I walk up to this woman. And when I walk up to the woman, I begin to witness to her. And me and Isaiah are witnessing to her, 
and we win her to Jesus. Not only do we win her to Jesus, we find out that she's sick. And we begin to pray for her and she gets healed. And as she gets healed, her two children get saved and begin to weep before the Lord. And all of a sudden, we run into her husband. Well, when we run into her husband, guess what happens next? He's not real happy about what's going on. Understand this, people that are living and born in chaos don't know what real peace is like. People that have had chaos their entire life don't know what real peace looks like. And a lot of times, listen, if you start to pray for the wild ones, if you want the junkies and the drug addicts and the drunks, you're going to have to begin to understand they don't know what peace looks like and you're going to have to learn to love the hell right out of people no matter what they're going through. So this rascal in the dream gets really mad. And next thing you know, he starts chasing us with his Glock. And you want to know what Isaiah tells me? He says, dude, go cast the demon out of him. I'm like, are you serious right now? Dude, homeboy's chasing us with a Glock. Don't, listen, I'm a Marine. I do not, I'm, listen, I was not trained for that. I've got nothing. But he said, listen, you've got to begin to understand who you are in Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, brother, I see it in you. Go lay hands on him and cast the demon out. We are having revival in the supermarket. We get done. We hop in the car. He's like, dude, this is awesome. I'm like, this is incredible. He's like, this is how we roll in Cali, bro. This is how we roll in Cali. This is how we roll in Cali. So I looked at him. I said, this, I'm not going to be finished with this. Where do we go next? He said, let's go to the hospital. So we go to the hospital. And we start busting up in hospital rooms. And start raising people out of the hospital beds. Do you know what I'm getting at with all of this? Your ministry mandate is not in the four walls of a building. Your ministry mandate is that God is calling you to the streets for one soul. God is calling every person in this room. He's going to equip you. He's going to give you everything that you need to win Manteca for the kingdom of Almighty God. So do you know what this means? This means your family is going to experience revival. This means your local high school is going to experience revival. This means nothing can stop the king when he has a mandate for a company. God has a mandate for you. But the only way that you're going to catch this mandate is if you quit walking around with 30 pieces of silver in your pocket. We need to quit seeing the empty tithing and offering plates, but pockets full of silver because we love our lives more than we love the kingdom. Because I'm telling you right now, the moment that you give up your 30 pieces of silver and we go to embrace the king, I'm telling you right now, you're going to see thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me this day. Man, I'm telling you, ain't nobody in this room will go out and buy some cheap clothes and expect those things to last for 30 years. But yet we live off of a cheap grace in America that we think that we can podunk through this thing as cheap as we possibly can because hyper grace says that he already paid the price. I'm telling you right now, he paid the price, but you need to receive all of his suffering and the baptism of the cross, which means this, you die. Do you realize that when you get saved, God doesn't save you from Satan? You want to know what you get saved from? Yourself. God is saving you. And we need to get past this humanistic type teaching and doctrine that makes you think that church, I, I preached here not too long ago about the paradigm of infancy to adolescence to maturity. And most of the church in America sits in an adolescent stage where all they deal with is their identity and their selfishness of who they are in God. And they can't get past spiritual warfare to the place of becoming fully mature. That they raise up sons and daughters. That what they've done great, their sons and daughters will do double than what they have done. God, get us to the place in America where we look past ourselves in our Christianity. That our Christianity is more than just us coming to get a humanistic feel good. 
See, and I know that, I, I, listen, I preach this stuff at home, and I've had people come up to me, and they're just like, dude, why do you have to preach this message all the time? Because if you realize this, if there's one Charles Finney in the room that gets it, the nation gets flipped. If there's one Billy Graham in the room, then the entire nation gets flipped. I wasn't here to make you doctor feel good. I'm here to see a revivalist raised up that'll change an entire nation. See, when people come at me with that, I'm just like, you know what? You've made it about you rather than the kingdom of God. How have we gotten here? How, I'll tell you how we got here. In Mark chapter 9, there's a little boy that it says this. He was thrown into the fire and he was thrown into the water. It says it throws him into the fire. It throws him into the water. It tries to destroy him. Listen to what I'm saying. It throws him into the fire. It throws him into the water. It tries to destroy him. I say this to our congregation all the time. Quit reading your Bible and start reading your Bible. Don't just read your Bible to do your daily devotion. Make your life, make your entire life a devotion to God. Don't just read your Bible. Start to read your Bible. Start to read your Bible. So it throws him in the fire. It throws him in the water. It tries to destroy him. See, I understand this prophetically. Anything that fire begins to touch, you see the destruction. So fire represented in a young generation is what? Drugs, alcohol, sex, perversion, selfishness, greed, lust of money, pride of life. All those things you begin to see. But why water? Why would a demon throw a boy into water? If I throw water on you right now, you're not going to do anything. You want to know why? Because that's most of the American church. They're doing nothing. Normalcy. If I can't put a church into chaos and dysfunction, then guess what I'm going to do to them? I'm going to put them in the place of normalcy. And hear me today, Awaken 209. The most dangerous thing that you can do in a revival is get bored. The most dangerous thing that you can do with God, who, listen, hung the stars and the heavens, created everything, created you, set the captive free, sent his son to die on a cross, to shed his blood, just to raise him back up in three days, is get bored with a God that can take nothing and start to make whatever he wants out of it. So do we really see, do we really see the importance of when it was throwing him into the water, it was throwing him into the fire. Do we see that? See, I was the kid in the neighborhood that I grew up, I was a good athlete, came from a broken home. My daddy tried to kill me when I was little because the devil knew if he could kill me in my infancy. Because you want to know why he wanted to kill me in my infancy? Because if he ever knew if Jimmy Lovejoy reached full maturity of life, I was going to flip the world upside down and storm the gates of hell. So for those of you in the room that have a dysfunctional relationship with your father, what the enemy has tried to do is put rejection on your life. Why did he try to put rejection on your life? Because he is marked with rejection his entire life. Understand this, every relationship that you're in, the enemy has one thing that he wants to do. He wants to bring division and he wants to put a big hole of rejection in your life. How do you explain that biblically? I explain that biblically like this. We say that the devil fell because of pride. The devil didn't fall because of pride. You want to know what the devil fell from? what he couldn't have. If we could really get the paradigm that pride was the open door to the demonic realm, then we'd be shutting doors all over the place. But the problem is, is we get in so many dysfunctional relationships and carry so many conversations like Eve did that sets us up to the place of sin and failure that if we would just shut the door of rejection. God never told you to buy the house. God never told you to buy the car. God never told you to marry that woman. Because in Proverbs 3 it says, do not lean to your own understanding. But in all your ways begin to acknowledge God. You've got yourself in the mess. You're not fighting the devil. What you're fighting is you. And so you get caught in this paradigm of it throws me into the fire. It throws me into the water. It tries to destroy me. And it's a cycle, 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 cycle of life. How do we break the cycle? Number one, quit arguing religiously all the time of what God's trying to do. Here's the greatest thing that we can do right now. Just stop trying to figure it out. I have no idea how I got here. I have no idea how I got connected with Nino and Isaiah. I have no idea how I got connected with Eddie James. I have no idea how I got connected with Louis. I have no idea. 
All I know is that I've been through a bunch of hell, and the only thing that could begin to change the hell of my life is if I got down on my knees and began to pray. I did not go to seminary school. I did not get raised up in a religious way. All I knew how to do was my mom showed me how to pray, get on my knees, and cry out to a God that can take a bad thing and turn it into a good thing. Let me tell you where I come from. I'm the type of kid... That if you would have saw me in high school, arrogant, selfish, punk, all-county running back, had colleges wanting me to come run the football colleges like West Virginia, Kent State, areas in our area right there. Here's the thing, though. I got suckered into doing this thing called the Marine Corps. Was well, not a bad thing to do at all. You want to know why? Because I began to teach in front of three and 4,000 people in a place called the Philippines. I did not know at that time that God was setting me up that the day that I would step into my true identity, what I thought was hell, what I thought was bad, what I thought I didn't need in my life, the first day that I grabbed this microphone and began to surrender my life to Jesus Christ, it's like, whoa, I've already been doing this for the last four to six years of my life. A lot of times you don't see the process, all you want to see is the pain. And Jesus told him in James, in, in Matthew 20, 20, only if you drink from my suffering cup and be baptized in my baptism, which is death, burial, and resurrection, can you begin to walk in my authority. So guess what, you're going to have to walk in suffering. Guess what, you're going to have to begin to die out to yourself. But here's the good thing, life is coming through it all. Life is, it's not the finish line. I don't care what kind of hell you're going through. It's not the finish line. It's just a cycle. So I go in the Marine Corps. I move out to California. I live there for four years. I, I, I was stationed in a place called 29 Palms. And in the place of 29 Palms, I became addicted to steroids. I became an alcoholic. I became everything that I vowed I would never be, Nino. Because in my own arrogance and pride, I would vow to everybody that I would never be like Bill Nutter. But here's the thing. I was born to be like Bill Nutter. Until I could take on the DNA of my heavenly father, Jesus Christ. I was born to be that way. I was born to be a drug addicted, alcohol, womanizing, selfish, arrogant punk. But God knew through covenant of a blood shed on Calvary. That through the process of the hell that I was going through. There would be a day that I would come to an altar. And God would mark me with fire. And say, hey. I've got a different plan for you. You want to know what my altar call looked like? I was in a church service, strung out on meth, roids, friends from church because my mom and dad were revivalists. My mom and dad were in a southern gospel group and they sung all over Ohio and Indiana and West Virginia and Washington, D.C. That Every weekend I was in church somewhere. So I had friends that were raised in the faith and I had a friend that was a youth pastor. And here's the thing, for some of you that are going through some hell tonight, <laughs> No, no, come on, you don't get it. Somebody that's going through some hell tonight, praise Jesus. Praise the Lord that you're going through hell. See, I don't like to glorify sin, and I don't like to glorify the devil. But this is going to stretch your theology. I'm thankful for sin. Whew, that'll get real quiet real quick, won't it? You want to know why I'm thankful for sin? Because if it wasn't for sin, we wouldn't need a redeemer. We wouldn't need a savior. Come on, somebody. We wouldn't have to have hope for tomorrow. So in my midst of doing what I want to do with my life, in my own free will, in my own cycle patterns, I come to the place where I'm addicted, I'm strung out, I'm, I think I'm better than who I really am. And I come to this place at an altar, and this is what the altar call looked like. I'm in an auditorium like this with about 500 people. And the church service is just rocking. And this is what I get marked in. I love when God takes the fire and the water that you're being thrown into. Because so many people want you to be normal. And so many people want you to be in fake fire of a radical fire for the world. In the midst of that, the pastor stands up on the stage. And he shuts down the Pentecostal jump. He shuts it down. You want to know what happens? The next thing that happens, he just... Stands there weeping. Travail hits the whole auditorium. 
God was taking a moment in a service like this for me. I'm sitting in the very back because the only reason I started coming to church is because I was making $80,000 a year, but I was filing bankruptcy. May not seem like a lot of money in California because the cost of living is different, but in Ohio, that's a lot. Okay. What you guys pay $300,000 for a ranch home, we buy for $70,000. Okay, so $80,000 is a lot of money in Ohio. All right. So in the midst of this, in the very midst of this, I'm filing bankruptcy. Everything's falling apart in my life. I've already had two DUIs. I just got hit with an assault charge because I was a hand-to-hand combat instructor when I was in the Marine Corps. And I thought because I was a state uh, champion wrestler and because I could do did certain things with my hands, I always thought I had to prove my respect with my hands. So in that, a guy pulls a knife on me outside the bar and I begin to assault him to the point that I almost beat him to death. So I've done been to court three times in six months. I say it like this, the judge was not happy to see me. But God was using all of this cycle and all of this hell to get me back to the place where he could call me by name because he was not done pursuing me. He was not done with me. It was not my finish line. So to top it all off, guess what I got? I had an STD called HPV. It's called genital warts for those of you who don't know it. I'm supposed to have this the rest of my life. Guess what else I get diagnosed with? I get diagnosed with cancer, and I don't want to tell anybody about it. So even in the midst of all of this, I have to begin to return to God, but I don't want to return to God in the religious, judgmental, stereotype legalism. So all I did at the age of 26 was start going to a home group. I just start going to a home group, and I'm secretly crying out to God, but I was one of those people that I wanted to live halfway in and halfway out because I really wasn't ready to give up my life. I wanted him to fix me. But I wasn't ready to surrender. I wanted him to fix my circumstance, fix fix my situation. God will fix your situation when you realize that the situation was sent to fix you. And once you fix you, God will begin to fix your situation. The best worship that could be in this house tonight is our burning flesh on an altar. And the dead aroma of my worldly life going up to heaven. I usually don't, you want to know the truth, I've never preached my testimony this first time. First time. Youth pastor for seven years, been a pastor for 15 months, and I've never preached my testimony. But somebody's got to hear this tonight. Because somebody is going to have a mantle of evangelism to the nation. And you've been going through a cycle, and God's about to break it. And you're about to die. You're about to die, friend. You're about to die a death that is glorious. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. You're going to die a death tonight that you won't be offended anymore. You don't want the addiction anymore. You don't want the life of the world anymore. So sitting in the back of that church service as the pastor's weeping. I sit there under conviction and begin to weep. And mind you, I took a kid to me that had never been to church in his life. He was my partying buddy, but he joined the church softball team with me. Because, man, he could hit the ball. And so Clint comes to church with me for the first time in his life. And all of a sudden, after 20 minutes of travailing with about 500 people, all of a sudden this old woman, mind you, hear me. Hear me, young generation. I'm in my early 30s. Hear me, I don't know it all, I don't claim to know it all, I know that there's a heritage that plowed ground for me to get to the place that I'm at today, and I will not neglect my heritage, but I'm going to take the zeal of a young generation and marry it to the wisdom of an older generation, and watch revival hit America, and watch America turn back to God. So in that night on March 16th, This woman begins to speak in tongues, and I was raised in Pentecost, so I was not afraid of the gift. And as she began to speak in tongues, understand this, that when tongues and interpretation comes forth, the first part, the Bible says, is for edification for the church. The second is to begin to call sinners home. A lot of us have heard the shit about a Hyundai, but about a Kia, and all this glorified stuff to the church. Mind you... I'm 26, 27 years old at this time, six years ago. 
And all of a sudden, this tongue begins to come forth, and there was a travail and a roar. And guess what happened? It wasn't a pretty little tongue and interpretation that came forth. No, it was a warning from God. See, the Bible says that you're saved through what? Faith. We're not justified through works. Do you want to know what faith really is? Faith is an experience from God. The Bible says that faith cometh from hearing and hearing cometh from the word of God. Do you know that the word hearing in the Greek is the word ekilohim? That means faith comes from experience. That literally the faith that saves you is not from a repeated prayer that is not even in the Bible, but a prayer that is prayed when you begin to experience something that created the heavens and the earth. Faith will save you when the Holy Spirit draws you and you have an encounter that you get marked and you don't want to live. Are you preaching once saved, always saved? No, but I'm telling you like this. Once you get saved, guess what? You're going to get rocked and flipped upside down, and you're not going to want any other thing again. So I say it like this. I had felt the presence of God, but now I believe I was about to have an encounter with the glory of God. Because the interpretation came for like this. I knew you were going to be here. And son, now we're getting personal. Because he knows that there's male and females in the room. He said, son, I've called you by name. And I have called you many times. But tonight... If you don't answer the call that I have on your life tonight, then you will not make it by your mother's anointing or your grandmother's anointing. But I have anointed you for a time such as this. And you, my son, better yield to me now. You know what the last part of that was? If you don't, I'm done with you. You want to know what happened? I still didn't go. The man sitting next to me became the first man that I youth pastored for. I could literally hear him and his entire family praying, God, soften Jimmy's heart. Soften Jimmy's heart. Oh, God, save Jimmy from the drugs and the alcohol and the perversion. Save Jimmy, God. Save a guy I went to church with when I was a little kid. Walks all the way from the other side. 500 people are wailing and travailing. He walks up. I can see him out of the corner of my eye. God save Jimmy. God save Jimmy. Let this be his moment. God save him. I look up on the drums and my best friend that I've known since I was three years old is on the drums. He was the youth pastor of the church. I have shed blood with this man. I, listen, we have fought blood, sweat, and tears together in bars. He was my brother. And I look up at him and I see Jason Walker up and he hits his chest and he says, I love you. And I still didn't move. You want to know when I moved? When the kid that I brought to church that had never been here put his arm around me, weeping in the Holy Ghost, and says, Jimmy, I don't know what's going on right now. I've never been to church in my life. He said, but I'm telling you right now, there's something inside me that keeps rolling over my voice that God's saying, he loves you and he wants you. Yeah, come on, give the Lord praise. I got up from that altar. Not only did I go to that altar and give my life to the Lord, but Clint got up and gave his life to the Lord. And why am I telling you this story tonight? Because of this. Because the day that you went to an altar, God just didn't see you go to an altar. But he saw everybody that you were going to impact go to an altar as well. You were born for revival. Break the cycle. Break the cycle. Break the cycle. And you know what's going to break this cycle? What's going to break this cycle is surrender and death. You know what's going to break this cycle? 
When generations can quit fighting over what they think church is supposed to look like, like it says in Mark 9, that literally the scribes begin to argue with the disciples, and Jesus comes on the scene, and you know what he says? He says, you faithless and perverse generation, how long do you got to be with me before you start to realize what I'm really capable of through you? See, this perversion is not of pornography and Playboy bunnies. You know what this perversion is of? Perversion is not just lust. Perversion is a twisting of the truth, young man. That's why perversion heads up not only homosexuality and sex before marriage and, and, and heads up por uh, the pornography addiction. Perversion also heads up what you think of yourself. Some of you in here are struggling with perverted thoughts that you think that you can never go out into the grocery store and begin to win people, but you have an apostolic voice that is speaking in this house by the name of Nino that's telling his sons and daughters, you're going to go into the grocery store, you're going to go into the restaurants, we're going to set up a barbecue, and we're going to see people come, get baptized, healed, set free, delivered. See, because when a father sets up an atmosphere, what begins to happen is a young man finds identity. Not only does he find identity, but he gets healed of HPV. Do you know that that day that I came to an altar saying, I'm going to put my flesh on an altar, God consumed up every infirmity that was in my life. Do you want to know? What infirmity I did not know got consumed up was the cancer. A year later, I met my beautiful wife in 2007. She began to get these notices to the door from UPS. Constantly, the hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic and Robinson Memorial were wanting me to sign documentation saying they would not be held responsible for what choice that I made. You want to know what choice that I made? I got so wrecked at that altar. I remembered every prophecy when I was in those youth camps, when I was 10 years old, all those places that my parents would travel, and I was the one that had prophesied written real big on his forehead, and they would be like, you, come here. <laughs> you, you're going to preach to the nations, but hold on a second, I'm a D average student. You're going to preach to the nations, hold on a second, I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. You're going to preach to the nation. I can't have any type of relationship because I'm so stuck in rejection from my real biological father. There's no way that I'm ever going to be able to witness to anybody. But I'm telling you, the moment that you hear the voice of the one that is calling you to wrap his arms around you in your dysfunction to break your cycles, you'll never be the same again. So you want to know what happened with the cancer, don't you? Mind you, 2007, I have an encounter with the Lord. I get married. My wife trusts me as the authority of my house. We go into ministries. Years go by, we forget all about it. Can I tell you right now, don't get mad at Obama. Because Obama's mistakes is what's setting up America for a revival. Listen, the issue in America is not the government. The issue in America is not the activist groups. The issue in America is a dead, dry, religious church that won't get a hold of the throne of God. So I get a letter from Obama this year because I'm a veteran and I have veterans insurance. And I get this letter that we are canceling all your insurance because you never told the VA that you had cancer. And because you never reported it, we're taking every bit of your insurance unless you go get tested. So here I am in the middle of finally stepping into my identity, stepping into our ministry. This is just a month ago, Nino. We're 14 months in the middle of a hillbilly Appalachian revival. Literally, I watch guys come in and put chew in the stage. Listen, they'll literally pull their chew out. And put it in. But by the time altar call comes, guess what happens? They come off the bleachers weeping. <laughs> we have three of the major drug dealers from Youngstown, Cleveland, and Akron in our ministry. 
And listen, nobody told him. The day that Doug Stubbs got saved two months ago, he went home and took his entire product and flushed it down the toilet and got rid of every bit of it. God didn't just see me go to an altar, but he saw drug dealers and heroin addicts go to an altar. You are more than just an ordinary person. So we tell nobody in our ministry that I have to go get tested. We tell nobody. Guess what comes and latches upon me? Fear. Doubt. I'm weeping in my wife's lap. And all I can think about is my four beautiful babies and my beautiful wife. And start to think about all the people that are getting equipped. Misfits. Dysfunctional. I'm telling you, divorced families coming back together. Dysfunctional families that are having revival because we refuse to do it the ordinary way. We refuse to be normal. So I suck it up and I go get tested. I get tested because, mind you, I looked at my wife and said, I'm not going to be a revivalist. And be going through chemo. Am I telling somebody in here to quit your medication? Only if the Holy Spirit spoke to you. Because I'm telling you, the day that I got diagnosed, I said, bull crap. Sorry for the religious poo-poo, dung, whatever you want to call it, feces. I was not going to be held down with this junk in my life when God said there's more for you, Jimmy Lovejoy. I'm not going to be held down by the opinions of a man. I will not be held down by man in fear for my identity. I go get tested, they do blood work, I'm literally in the hospital for nine hours getting tested. Two weeks go by, I walk into our church, I'm holding the letter. You know what it says? Don't come back for two years because we can't find a trace of anything. Don't come back for two years! Every single one of you in this room has a story, and the story needs to be released to America because I don't want to hear some yuppie glorified pimp in a pulpit begin to tell me about life when you ain't never been through no hell. I'm not bashing church leaders, but I'm telling you right now, those people that do it your way, you continue to do it your way. But don't bust my chops, baby, when I'm going to get the heroin addicts and the prostitutes and the alcoholics and the broken homes. Don't bust my chops. Because we're the loud church. We're the, we're the cult. But Nina was there when I didn't even have to say a word. And we picked up, uh, did, listen, just a month ago when Isaiah and Nina were there, there was a man, did he not walk like this, Nina? A farmer walked like this. His daddy was an alcoholic, committed suicide. Him and his wife had only been saved for two months. And he walked like this. His name was old Nate Cal Cavanaugh. I grew up with Nate. I wrestled with Nate. Nate was a drunken, bar brawling, nasty son of a gun. But about two months ago, you want to know how Nathan got saved? When we started going having church in the local bar. Every church was like, why are you doing this? I'm like, number one, they're a business, okay? And we're going to feed into the businesses of our company. And I'm not going to go down there and water down any message of the gospel. My wife's going to go in and sing praises to Almighty God. We watched people come from the bar side to the concert venue side, laying down crack pipes, leaving their beer in the other side, and coming on over and getting wrecked under the power of the Holy Ghost. The Bible said go into the world, but don't be of the world. I'm not going to water this thing down with some cheap grace. I'm going to talk about the cross and the blood that was shed. For a year when we started our ministry on Monday nights, we would go have worship and the word at Stringy Wings. And Nathan Cavanaugh gave his heart to the Lord there. Not only did he get saved, but his wife got saved. Not only did his wife get saved, but his three children got saved. Come on.
This is what happens when you break cycles. This is what happens when you break cycles. I know I'm not the most elegant speaker. I know I don't have all the theology. All I know that I tapped into the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and I got his DNA running through my blood. All I know is I tapped into something that I can't keep to myself. I got to get it to the world. Nathan, Nino's sitting right there. An entire church of people sitting there. Dutch Sheets walks over to him. What did he start prophesying? There's oil wells. There's oil wells on somebody's property that's going to help fund the vision of overtaking. Nathan begins to weep. Not only is he telling him that you have one oil, he said the first oil well, you're going to give to overtaking. And the next two is going to help suffice and supply everything that your family needs, that your great grandkids need. Because there's oil in those Appalachian mountains that nobody wanted to work for. Do you hear what I'm saying? There's oil in a place that you've got to sacrifice and begin to break down some idols for. So in the midst of that, I just said, Nathan, sit down. Nathan sits down. I'm telling you, his foot was five inches longer than the other one. Was it not, Nino? I didn't even get to the place to say, in the name of Jesus. The moment that I picked his feet up, Dutch is slapping me on the back saying, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. That man called me from work the next day and he said, I don't know how to deal with this. I said, what do you mean? He said, I ain't walked normal ever in my life. I've never walked normal in my life. Where does all this come from? It comes from someone that makes a willing sacrifice to break cycles of fire and even normal. Some of you in here are straight going through hell. And God said, I'm going to break the cycle. Some of you in here are so complacent and so normal, you think that's your identity and it's not. God's called you to be a burning radical Nazarite. And understand this, you want to know what broke the cycle in the boy's life? Because Jesus asked the boy, asked the daddy's boy, he said, how long has he dealt with this? And he said, since he was a child. So you know what's going to get broken in this house tonight? Generational curses. Just because daddy was a drunk, don't mean you're a drunk. Just because mom and dad were in welfare, doesn't mean you got to be in welfare. Just because mom and dad suffered with it, doesn't mean that you have to suffer with it anymore. The father brings the boy. Why do we need to marry the young with the old? Because the multitude doesn't get fed unless the little boy gives up his lunch. The only individual that was prepared out of 15,000. See, I'm stretching your theology because it says there was 5,000 men and women and children. So if there's at least every wife, that gives us another 5,000. At least if everyone had a kid, there's 15,000. So I say there was about 15,000 present, but there was only one that had enough endurance to want to go another day that packed a lunch. He was, more, uh, listen, he wanted more than a Sunday service. He said, I want to encounter the one that hung the stars, and I want to walk with him, and I want to be prepared. So the next time that you see a kid that's willing to go the distance in a prayer meeting, you better tap in to what he's eating on. Why do we have to marry the young and the old? Because if a little boy don't put Samson's hands upon the pillar, then the Philistines don't get killed and a man doesn't live out his dream. Because there was an old man named Samson that lost his sight. He lost his vision. But what does the Bible say? In the last day I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. What? Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will have visions, and your old man will dream dreams. So those that compromised the Nazarite vow of consecration on their life and started to lose their vision, they still have the dream that's inside of them, and they're just looking for a little boy to put the hands up on the pillar to say, use me one more time, God. Use me one more time. You want to know what breaks all cycles? A willingness of consecration. The dirtiest word in the prosperity church right now is they want all of your money, but they don't want all of you. 
The Bible says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. That the man would go and bury the treasure, sell off everything that he owns, and buy the field. Hear me, those of you that have been hurt in church. You're still a treasure. I'm sorry that you had a leader that wasn't willing to buy your field. We want people's treasures, but we don't want to deal with their rocks. I know that there's an apostolic anointing on this man for this church that's willing to walk through the field and pick up a rock of rejection. There's a woman sitting right here that'll pick up a rock of insecurity. That'll pick up a rock of fear. That'll pick up a rock. They'll sit and plow the... See, I'm a farmer. I understand that there's hours upon hours in plowing the field to reap the treasure of harvest. So it wasn't until the Father took the Son to Jesus. And that still wasn't enough. You want to know what shifted the whole paradigm? When the Father cried out, help me to deal with my unbelief. God, help us to deal with whatever it takes to get a generation to Jesus. Whatever it takes, God, help us deal with our unbelief. If it's through wrath, clothes, I don't care. See, you'll get this heart. See, just like this man who will take up an offering and dump it back out into the city. This is why I know we're family. Because... A month ago, we had a young man that was clean from heroin. Heroin's an epidemic in our county. It's an epidemic. There was a young man that had been clean for five months. But he still hadn't broken a little bit of the cycle. So you know what happens? He used just one more time. One more time may cost you everything. One more time may get you an STD. One more time, may get you pregnant out of wedlock. One more time, one more drink before you drive can get you wrapped around a telephone pole. One more hit of that meth that had a little too much uh, 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 cleaner in it can take you to a grave. One more time can be the end of time for you. And heaven and hell is real. Marky used one more time. I get a phone call in the middle of the night. The phone call in the middle of the night is this. Jimmy, you got to get over here. you got to get to the hood. you got to get to the hood. Marky's drowning in his vomit. He's been laying here for two and a half hours. you got to get here now. I rushed as fast as I could with the elder from the church. We were driving 20 minutes away to what we call the ghetto of our town. And I'm flying over there drastically to get there. And when I get there, I already see the ambulance pulling out. Four times. On the way to the hospital, Marky died. They get into the ER, there's 30 men from overtaken laying in the ER. We don't care who's there. We don't care who's there. We are crying out to God for our brother. Because I don't care that he used again. I don't care. You can judge me in this room, I don't care. He's still a soul, and he had a covenant with God. And then we reminded God of covenant rather than sin. You need to quit pointing fingers and judging people because of the hell that they're going through and start reminding God of the covenant that he made on a cross with them. They're in covenant. Covenant is bigger than sin. I'm not saying you can live however you want, but quit glorifying sin and start glorifying the covenant of blood. The doctor comes in, says, Mark, he's flatlined six more times. There's nothing that we can do. At that time, a doctor in our ministry that just had got back from Peru grabs me by the arm and says, come on. And while they're in there fr frantically working to get Marky's heart back going, we walk in. And the moment we walked in, I'm telling you, there was a band of angels with us. Because every nurse and doctor stepped back in the room. And when they stepped back in the room, we laid our hands on Marky's chest and we began to rebuke death. You don't have the keys anymore. He shall live and not die. He shall live. And that heroin addict's heart began to beat again. His heart beats again. 
They rush him to the ICU. He doesn't flatline anymore. But then the next day, the doctor comes in and says he'll have severe brain damage because he died 10 times. I said, no, he won't. They said, he's going to have severe lung damage. No, he won't. He's not going to be able to function. Listen, I'm telling you right now, there's no damage to the heart. There's no damage to the lungs. There's no damage to the brain. He's alive. You want to know why I believe that that broke with Marky that night? The same way when that epileptic boy died. See, the Bible says that he died and he convulsed. The scripture says that, man, to everyone, he looked as if he was dead because the fire had destroyed him. Don't you know that when you go to break a cycle, that whatever you're struggling with is going to convulse you and shake you one more time? If you're afraid of finances, get ready to get shooken over. If you're afraid of your kids falling back into drugs, get ready to get shook one more time. If you think your marriage is about to fall apart, get ready to get shook. But when do you stand and let God be God? Because all God did was reach, oh, hear me, let somebody die. Because you can't be made new until you die. If you have old idols, die tonight. I'm not giving an altar call. Let's have a funeral service. Come on, somebody needs to be ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Be made new under the blood of Jesus Christ. You know what I love about this? Jesus looks at all the perverse twisting of the truth. The strongholds. You know what a stronghold is? The weapons of a warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. You know what a stronghold is? It's a lie perceived to be the truth. Some of you have bought into a lie because you believe your emotions more than you believe God. And you want to know what breaks the cycles? Well, I've been free for a year, so is the cycle broken. I've been free for three years. Are you really free? Is the cycle really broken? Because I can tell you a youth pastor that went to that altar and that story, that went back to youth pastoring, and because I lost, listen, because I lost our first child, Tina and I's first child died. And guess what happened? Tina and I weren't intimate for three months. And because I really wasn't free from one thing, one little thing that I kept here, guess what happened to a youth pastor that was on fire? I fell back into pornography. And until I was willing to bring every secret in my life to light. See, sometimes you don't realize what's in your closet. You don't realize the unforgiveness that's laying dormant there. Because you remember the man Samson? That needed a young man to put his hands because he lost his vision. See, we all think that Samson's issue was lust. Samson's issue wasn't lust. Samson's issue was rejection. He held on to Delilah so tight, you want to know why? Because when the Bible says that he was an anointed man of God on fire, while he was out doing the Lord's work, his best friend slept with his first wife. See, you don't ever hear about the story of the first wife. All you hear is about the second wife that cut him. Listen, the one that cut his hair was not the real issue. Delilah wasn't the issue. It was the first one that rejected him. And because he held a seed of rejection that nobody knew about, he started to lose his vision. And guess what happened? He started to get bored with revival. And because he wouldn't allow himself to be healed of rejection, he laid his head on Delilah's lap. And her words were more soothing than the presence of God. So you want to know what breaks cycles? Jesus looks at him and says, this thing only comes but from what? Prayer and fasting. Well, I don't believe in that old consecration thing, brother. Then you missed the part in Genesis. Remember, read your Bible. You missed the part where what was Adam's consecration? Don't touch a tree. 
What do you mean? I can't watch the movies. I can't listen to music. What do you mean? Would you rather walk with God or please yourself? And where's the transformation of identity? What takes Moses from presence to glory? What was the so simple consecration? Does anybody remember? What was Moses' consecration? Because the Bible said he was in the presence, but when he crossed the line, he went to glory. There's a difference. Sometimes we think it's presence and glory, and I'm telling you right now, when you step into glory, identities get shifted. What was his consecration? Moses, take your shoes off. Shoes? Shoes. Shoes. What are you willing to lay on the altar tonight? Stand all over this place right now. I guess you're right, Nino. I didn't need to play them tonight. Everybody in the room, close your eyes. If you can begin to play me some music softly. My question to you is, what have you not put on an altar? What cycle of unforgiveness and bitterness and rejection do you see yourself begin to walk into at times? Do you know that it wasn't until two years ago I'm seeing people healed. I'm seeing revival. I watched a youth group go from one kid to 150. But you want to know what root of rejection I still had inside me that was a cycle? I still thought that Jimmy Lovejoy could change Jimmy Lovejoy. And I never began to realize how deep Bill Nutter wounded me. 30 years old. Still thinking about high school days. Why would my dad never come see me play a football game? Never come see me win a wrestling match? Never come see me? And you know what the truth of all of it was? I never told anybody, not even my wife. But that seed of rejection was affecting my marriage. I always felt disrespected. How many of us in the room, you know God has more for your life? There's already hands going up, and I ain't even asked for it. How many know that there's more to your life than where you're at? Then let's die to ourselves tonight and be alive in Christ. Who in the room's been abused? Who's, who in the room's been stabbed in the back? I told you my story. Now the world deserves to hear yours. No more sitting in insecurity and fear. How many in this room feel like they, they, they just don't even really know who their full identity is in Christ? Raise your hand. If you haven't found it, raise your hand. Raise your hand. How many of us, over the past couple months, we want to win people to Jesus, we just don't know how to. Come on. Somebody in your family, somebody in your city is waiting for you to respond to an altar tonight. See, the last story that I'm going to tell you is that bar owner that people started getting saved in. See, that day that I died, God saw Chef Bill Walk into an old hot gym. You know what happened six months ago? Chef Bill gave his life to Jesus. His wife did and his kids did. And you want to know what happened to that bar that we would go do worship in? It got shut down. God can take the most ordinary thing and glorify it when there's true surrender. Sometimes it's hard to surrender when the wounds are so deep. Listen to me, ministry leader. You don't know how many pastors looked at me and said, your fire's too hot. 
You're too emotional when you preach. You need to calm it down. And you know what? That seed of rejection in me would birth insecurity. And I'd be like, you're right. I started listening to the wrong voices. But I had such a deep, burning passion to see souls saved. Listen, don't sit in that seat. Don't sit in that seat tonight. If you're not walking in the fullness thereof, come build an altar tonight, please. Please, I was raised in church. I responded to many altar calls, but there was only one night of surrender. Don't get bored with God. Don't get bored with revival. Break a cycle, man. There's already people coming. Come on, who else? Come, come, just come. Run, run to the altar. Run to the altar tonight. Run to the altar tonight. Run to the altar tonight. Run to Jesus.